Hey guys, I think we're back. Right. We've had today. Technical difficulties. Um let's get deep back in line. Alright, there we go. <laughs> Alright, I hope we're back. I hope we're back. Yeah. Um, I I did say it was quite warm today, didn't I, when we did the uh, <laughs> yeah. chat before. Um I didn't think my phone was going to be overheating today, so <laughs> that's a bit different. Um, yeah, should we talk a bit about kids and development, maybe nutrition? Because I think that's something that everyone can obviously have a, a lot to say about. Um, yeah. There's a lot to talk about there because there's a lot of mis misinformation. Um, what kind of things are you telling your patients and your parents who are coming in? when we start talking about food, when we start talking about, you know, the diet that people are having? It's a really good question, man, and it's, like, very loaded. So I always say it's a matter of perspective. So I, I'm more of, like, an all-natural person. So for me personally, like, I've gone vegan. I've gone plant-based. Mm -hmm. um, own reasons. I've seen a huge, 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 you know, change in, in that. So a lot of these things, I'll, I'll leave the actual specifics of that to like dietitians, um, you know, so I don't want to step on their toes and every family's needs is totally different. Like, you know, and, and especially here in the States, going out and getting organic, like isn't the most convenient or easiest things, especially during this quarantine uh, with people losing their jobs. So I, I totally understand. I respect that. When it comes to this diet, for, for me with my patients, I am more focused on kind of the sugar aspect of things. And I'm talking about, or if, if they want their over like when when to have juices when to have milk um i pr really encourage them during full times i go over a lot of the ph curve with parents and kind of help them understand hey like you know it's there's a formula that i have like that I go over every parent and it's sugar plus bacteria equals acid the whole goal here is that, that acid is what's going to create cavities and especially children who have in enamel to begin with there's times um they're not the best at, at home care they're not the most kids so the chance of getting cavities increase when you look at early childhood caries it's like the most prevalent chronic disease in kids five times more than asthma seven, i think 78 more times more prevalent than like hay fever so these are things i'm trying to explain to them that hey this is like a very chronic condition and how to just implement good good hygiene from the beginning um going over a dental home uh going over anticipatory guidance i'm big on anticipatory guidance because i feel like i'm blessed and i'm lucky enough about twice a year like if they're cavity free the other three days like you really need to know how to manage that and what to do um and sure we're here and we're here to help you know take care of cavities but um it's not something i don't want to see your child in pain because you know of, of, of negligence on my part or something on your part that you didn't understand um so it's a lot of lot of lot of anticipatory guidance and going over diet and things of that nature a lot of sugar reduction yeah, I think that's something that we really struggle with, especially, well, I don't know about in the States, but especially in the UK. Um, I think the biggest, one of the biggest causes of uh, infant GA or child mm -hmm. GA is for multiple extractions. Uh, I don't know if that's similar in the US, but um, when you really think about that, dental decay is something which is completely, I'm not going to say self-inflicted for children because there are other people in charge of the deal, in, in, in charge of the, the meals, uh, but it's entirely avoidable if you are uh, kind of looking after things. Sorry if I'm wobbling around now. I can't put myself in the uh, uh, the mount. Uh, I'm not, not I'm not used to holding it in my hands. Um, I just don't want it to overheat again. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's something which we really struggle with. And obviously, if you think about that, then you're putting for a GA, uh, high risk of, well, much higher risk of complications on the GA, uh, including death in the very worst circumstances, uh, which obviously you don't want to think about, but um, it's, it's something that's there and something that you have to um, kind of weigh up as well. So true. That's the same issue, man. I feel like processed sugars and uh, there's a really funny thing. If you, if you look at like the tr cereal, the trick cereal back from the 1980s, Three colors, my man. Three. Mm. If you look at the cereal now, it's like they've gone through like eight, eight different colors. All these additive dyes, food coloring, and things like that. And um, I always say, like, you know, it's just it's important to read the labels. And and for me, it's just been as natural, be as natural as possible. Whether it's your food, um, whether it's like toothpaste. Um, I'm big on like you know like natural toothpaste. I, I love xylitol based toothpaste. I'm not anti fluoride, but I think I've yet to find a fluoridated toothpaste. 
that is also SLS free, doesn't have carrageenan, doesn't have propylene glycol, um, it doesn't have you know, all these like artificial sweeteners. Like it, it's hard to find for me, I've yet to find that perfect like toothpaste that has fluoride and like is natural. So um, these are just things I, I recommend because like, you know, the mucosa is a very absorbable membrane. And so what you're putting into your mouth is can also affect the outcome. And uh, there's a good link. A lot of people, like I said, a lot of like kids or patients who come in and they have mouth, mouth ulcers, uh, aptus ulcers, they're using an SLS based paste. You remove the SLS based, um, the SLS component from toothpaste, and it's like voila, sometimes the, the, the canker sort of gone. And so, um, yeah, it's just a lot of education. And sometimes I feel like in dental school, like I, I was never not really taught this, it wasn't really hammered. So it's been a lot of self learning, self relearning. Um, mm. but it's a good time to do it because when you're in dental school, all you really care about is hey, like, let, let me get the highest grade. That's <laughs> like rote, rote memorization, try to get through. Um, and you really don't get the aspect to really fully appreciate what you're learning and how to apply it to your life. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a perfect time to like, you know, for me to do that now, it's just kind of re relearn the books. And there's a lot of things I've realized, like, no, I, I didn't learn this and I'm glad I'm relearning it now. Yeah. Is, is the water fluoride in the States or not? There it, it's, it goes based off of like municipality or county so some areas do have it um some areas have well water some areas don't have it so you'll see a whole range a whole range of things because mm. there, there are obviously quite a lot of longitudinal studies uh which show the efficacy of uh, fluoridating a water source um to a very very small degree it is, isn't it it's only something like one part per million um but the amount of reduction in decay in in all communities is probably makes it worth it um Although I think people will kick up a fuss, you know, um, with all the uh, misinformation that gets bandied around around things. So um, that's that's the trouble there, isn't it? It is, man. Here in the States, like I think you can have 0.7 to 1.2 parts per million in your water, a range between, you know, mm -hmm. any that range. There's a really good study. I got to find it. I read it maybe about several months ago. It talked about how places like Japan and some of these um, countries – in Europe, don't like I think Greece is one of them. It might be another one um, where they don't have any water fluoridation, but the caries rate in com in those countries compared to the U.S. was much lower. I think a lot of that has to do with diet. Like they didn't even have fluoride, yeah. but it's a lot of diet driven. So that's like the mindset I try to put my parents in: is that listen, like kids are gonna be kids. You can give them a sweet every now and then, but like if they're having like loaded sugar every morning, like you're just, it's, it's just, it's a disaster waiting to happen um, at times. And so I feel like diet's a big component of it. But if you look at these things, like I said, I, I, I'm not anti-fluoride, but I'm more of a proponent of like topical fluoride. So as long yeah. as like, a child can spit okay, with the fluoride toothpaste or fluoride mouth rinse, um, I like the one, two punch of xylitol plus fluoride because they work, you know, they work both work well, but have different mechanisms of action. So you're really giving that bacteria a one, two punch. Um, but at the end of the day, like our biggest problem here in the States, man, people just can't get their hands off that damn sugar. And then that's the big, that's the biggest problem. I was going to say something uh, around those uh, kind of lines, because obviously I was not, I was in the States not so long ago. Um, and the food was really eye-opening to me and i don't want to like i didn't want to say anything because i didn't want to be like oh he's, he's bringing it up and bashing on them these guys um <laughs> open about all the time i was like the u.s food is terrible man there's a reason why there's so much obesity and all these things here it's just it's terrible i i was surprised because i thought all right i'm in chicago now um first off i was in north carolina i was like i wasn't expecting the food to be incredible because i was like it's a bit rural it's not going to be very you know uh gastronomic let's say um <laughs> and then I went to Detroit and it was a little bit better there because you know there's different populations, there's Arab populations, there was you know Indian Pakistani, so there was some more like um, interesting food, uh, yeah. cultural foods, different stuff. But I thought, okay, now I'm actually going to Chicago. I was in the suburbs in Detroit, and there was uh, every place I went, it felt like it was really heavy. The food was very heavy, very carby, very, very oily. And all the reviews are saying, this is the best place in so-and-so. I was like, really? Really? Um, <laughs> it, was, it was crazy to me. It was really eye-opening. And you could then understand why there is such a large problem in, in the States with obesity, with diabetes. And then, obviously, these all have uh, knock-on effects. Diabetes, we're looking at perio. If, uh, if it's bad for you know, sugars and you're looking at caries, and then it's a whole knock-on effect.
everything, man. Even like pre pre pubertal effects. I've seen more kids losing their, you know, teeth in the back that they should be losing around 12, 13 at like nine, eight, nine. Mm -hmm. All just, it's like, it's like Wonder Bread. When Wonder Bread came out, um, it was, it was all, all these effects of it, you know, processed stuff. It really, it's really messed with hormone, especially in, or as early as kids. And you, you can just see the effects of it in, in the dental field. So 100% agree, man. And then you got, yeah, you're right. Like perio. Um, I always say the, the mouth is the gateway to the rest of the body. And so, you know, what happens in the mouth would have a trickle down effect everywhere else. Yeah. It's something that I'm looking into. I've spoken to a few nutritionists, a few other, other people along those lines, hopefully going to be doing some lives with those guys and really go through micronutrition micronutrition then hopefully those things have a knock on effect because i think it's a very untouched subject within dentistry and medicine as well uh the food that you put in your body and the effect it has long term on everything so uh i think that's going to be really interesting if we can get someone who's uh, knowledgeable in those areas that'd be really good man that'd be great because i think the best, biggest misconception now is i think a lot of people have gone like vegan right vegan doesn't mean you're healthy you can eat really crappy vegan I mean, fried mm -hmm. stuff, right? Instead of being fried in canola oil, it could be fried in like um, coconut oil, right? So healthier oil, but you're still eating it fried. So it doesn't mean it's really, you know, better for you. And I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions. Um, and there's and like, there's a lot of great, like these cities, Chicago, Detroit, Philly, Atlanta, LA, great vegan places. And some of them have some really good options, but a lot of them also have some not so good options. And so I think that's the biggest misconception I see people say like, I've gone vegan. And then you look at their, what they're eating. It's like, yeah, I mean, you know, and it's hard to tell because I always say blood blood work is key, right? And um, once you get that, once you get your blood work done, I think it'll show a a big difference, also. Yeah, I, th I think that's going to be a really interesting kind of. I think that's the next step within all dentistry, whether it's pediatric or or any, anything, uh, of really understanding what's going on at cellular level, what's going on, like you say, in blood work, yeah. vitamins, yeah. minerals. How how are we healing after surgery? Yeah, I think that's going to be that's going to be really interesting. I think that's where most of our failure and success is going to lie. I agree. I absolutely agree. Uh, guys, we've got any questions for Deep. We went through a bunch of cases. I'm going to stick one of them up on screen uh, just so you know what we spoke about. Uh, I think this is a really nice photo. I think that shows that shows really well. Um, and this one here. So we've been talking laser phrenectomies um, and I think we we kind of saw that the effect you can make upon someone's life in such a quick kind of visit. How long do these cases take um, when you're doing them? It's on average about about like three minutes, two or three minutes. Mm. Um, in front of them itself, like you know, like I said, getting getting the laser itself probably about depending on depending on how thick that that frenum is and the underlying um, mucosa. Uh, the, the quick ones, like infants, are really tiny. You're talking about like maybe 10, 15 seconds. Uh, some of the ones that are a little bit longer, you can see, hey, like that that area, um, the surgical area looks like a little bit large, like a big crater. Those will take about maybe two and a half, three minutes. And then also yeah. the good having them stick their tongue out, going side to side, uh, and things like that. So, but the actual laser itself, I'd say a couple minutes max. And what do you what do we use in terms of local anesthetic um, for these cases? Are we topical first, and then an injection or yeah so for kids who are older i'd say you know five six seven i'll use a little bit of like benzocaine topical and then about like 0 0.5 to 1.0 you know cc's of two percent lidocaine one to one hundred thousand epi um and i kind of go right at the frenum area just like below it um and, and get that numb uh and that way i don't have to worry about going from each side of the tongue i just go right down the middle and that it takes care of it if i'm looking at the infants if they're a couple of weeks old to even a couple of months, sometimes I won't anesthetize at all, just kind of given benzocaine and, and the risk associated with methemoglobinemia. And so I will just like avoid, and those kids, since they're latching, they're feeding, the moment you do that, um, I had one this past Monday, a five week old, low, uh, lingual and labial, no anesthesia. Yeah. It. I do one at a time, so I'll do the lingual first, um, and then they, they can go and either breastfeed on mom or mom can give them the bottle, uh, whichever method they prefer. And then I let the baby calm down. And then if there is a second tire, if there's a labial at that point, I'll do that and then back. And then I reassess and kind of go over everything again. And so I try to go one, one by one. But for the younger ones, no, nah, they're great. They don't need anything. Yeah. Uh, cause it, it's so quick. So sometimes you could probably get in there and if you're very, very um, efficient, you can just get it done very, very nice and quickly. And then 
you know, within two weeks, like we've seen on some of the follow-ups, it's pretty much healed up and, and comfortable and, and ready to function as, as intended. Yeah, absolutely. Um, guys, any questions for Deep? I know we've we've gone through something that I think is very niche, so I think a lot of the guys here are just going, wow, I've never seen any of this before. Um, let's see anything on the question tab. Uh, but I, th I think this has been like really, really important because we heard the difference it can make in someone's life. So can you just recap that case? Let's let's get that that young man on screen again. Uh, where's he gone? He's got sunglasses. There we go. Yeah, eight-year-old male, healthy. Um, for the past four years, he was having speech issues. Uh, they couldn't under, under find out what was going on. They went to a couple different doctors. Everyone said he's fine. He'll grow out of it. That's the word I always hear. He'll grow out of it. Um, can't grow out of something if you don't get to the root cause. And so in his case, he did have a pretty decent um, – he was ankle, had an ankle gloss here or a, a lower tongue tie. Mm where it was really affecting not only, you know, bullying and, you know, affecting school life in that sense, but is really affecting their family dynamic at home where parents would keep asking them, hey, like, what are you saying I can't do you? Uh, and have them repeat certain words three, four, five times to the point where the child was like, I hate this, I hate you guys. Very strainful relationship on the home front. Um, lo and behold, once everyone was taken care of in terms of, you know, releasing that, releasing that frenum, he was able to see a speech therapist. They worked at it. I always say the tongue is like any other muscle. You have to train it, and you probably have to train it a little bit more than any other muscle because you get you got to retrain that muscle memory, how you've been saying things. So he's been working with a the speech therapist. I saw dad right before this whole quarantine hit, and they said it's just been a, a game changer for them. Um, whole, whole different world. You know, the relationship is different, um, and that's it. You know, that's, that's the most important thing is that, you know, families understanding each other and loving each other and just living the best quality of life that, that you possibly can. Mm. So it, these kind of surgeries are sometimes more – uh, you might say life changing as opposed to, you know, oh, we've just done something that's just, you know, there's a bit of decay there and we've, we've removed it. It's, it can be much more uh, of an effect on someone's actual life, uh, the way they experience things. And I think you said this patient was possibly on the route to maybe self harm in the future if, if it hadn't been caught on top of because of the lack of support structures. Uh, so I think that's really, uh, really important to kind of say that actually there's a lot that we can uh, we can improve with with relatively simple and small in, inter intervention. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then let's just recap this case as well because I want to put this on IGTV and I know we lost the last one with the with the overheat. Sure, no worries, man. Yeah, so th this one just shows you a prime example. This kid was about um, seven. Um, he was showing. What he's trying to show here that and what I'm trying to show is that the front end beforehand and the front end. <laughs> Really tell in the upper pictures but the bottom pictures was look at that range of motion um you can see mm -hmm. sticking his tongue out now in his case he didn't really have that invagination or that butt tongue um sometimes that's like a classic sign that you may see but look at the difference in that range of motion after it's done and and that range of motion is going to provide um a lot of benefit in terms of uh, three s's i talked about sweeping each so sweeping he's able to use that tongue and cleanse his must have, must have, uh, buccal vestibules um, from a speech standpoint. Hopefully it gets better and there's no issues with the sounds that are and phonetics that are involved with, with tongue ties, your th sounds like thunder, L's, lollipop, R's, Roger Rabbit, um, sometimes N, like neighbor or Nancy, where you need that tongue to go to a certain place. It, the D words like zoo, where your tongue has to be at a certain spot. Um, and the last yeah. one I'm uh, sleep, which is, you know, very, very, I think, undermined and not that many people think of. Um, when you're sleeping, your tongue, like I said, when you swallow, you'll notice your tongue's home, its natural home, is the roof of the mouth. And these kids, they might start off sleeping there, but within, once they get into a little bit of a deeper sleep, that mouth opens and the tongue rests on the floor, they're snoring, that snoring can affect, you know, they, they can have, you know, sleep disorder breathing that's affecting the quality of sleep. It leads to poor performance in school or in activities the next day. And the other thing people don't realize, if you're sleeping like this, you're going to start to get more of a dolgocephalic facial profile because um, everything's kind of growing downward. Um, and that's also happened to us evolutionarily. Um, there's a reason why, you know, th our thirds are not fitting like they once did, but now you're just kind of adding to the injury um, and you're getting more of a, a, an elongated or dolgocephalic facial profile. Yeah. Um, 
in terms of the actual surgeries that you do, are these uh, by secondary intention healing or do you put sutures? Where do you stand on that issue? Yeah by secondary um, intention um, since I'm using the laser I don't put any I have not um, put any stitches with these and I found uh, the healing to be fantastic and great less post-op phone calls um, and kids are usually like I said a little bit of discomfort I do tell parents hey it's a surgery so they might have a little bit of tenderness but nothing that you know children's Tylenol or Motrin can't handle um, yeah. I use I, l I learned these before I even got to the laser a couple of years back. I would do them the old fashioned way, 15 blade, um, blunt dissection, scissors, you know, things like that. Um, and the results were still there. I just felt like it was a lot of, just took a little bit longer and I would get a lot more post-op phone calls. Oh, the suture came out. Oh, there's a little bit of bleeding now at the site. Um, and I really realized that, Hey, as a provider, you want to be able to be able to go to bed at night, like sleeping peacefully. Um, even though, you know, we all do good work. It's just that that phone call that comes in and I realized that, Hey, by switching over to the laser, it just, makes it 10 times easier um, not just for myself but in terms of patient care as well yeah and you're using a biolase um, correct the diet what's the yeah. difference diet. between the biolase and um, you know the other co2s etc etc yeah so i use um for the two that i've worked with um i worked i initially started learning how to do these with a co2 um they cut a lot smoother it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a true laser where you're not having direct tissue contact when you're cutting so i'm about maybe a couple of mil a few millimeters away from my tissue that i want to cut and it'll cut very clean i don't need that direct tissue contact which is great um the bio lace which i've used i've still like i still like it a lot the only difference is you have to have the tip of the laser in direct contact with the tissue that you're cutting yeah. um, and that's different between those those two lasers i do feel the co2 just cuts a little bit cleaner um but at the end of the day like you i don't think it's gonna make that big of a, of a difference since it's still a laser are they easy to control uh in terms because i always think you know you've got this little laser that's pointing around and if you you know if you just move to a little bit to the left you see when someone nudges you or something but is it is it is it dangerous in that respect or not it, it can be Yes, it absolutely can, especially the CO two lasers. Okay, I feel like you're cutting, like you can, like, and if you try on pig's feet, for example, you can literally, like, if you move the pig's feet, like, it's it's cutting with it. Um, so in that sense, like, if you're if you're new to this, I definitely recommend the BioLace. Um, when I'm the BioLace, I just just recommend a diode laser because it's going to get you comfortable where you're not going to overcut or you're not going to accidentally mm -hmm. cut because you need direct tissue contact with it. Um, but yeah, with, with the CO two, if you're not careful, you can do more harm than good. Now, I, did I once have a kid move on me and I kind of got a little bit more of, of the lower floor of the mouth? Yeah, it's going to happen to like any, anyone, but you're not, pen, you're not penetrating so deep, so to speak. So it's not going to really make a, a big difference. But you might see a little sliver like that, the laser cut. You're, you're not going to get bleeding once again because it's cauterizing. Um, but there is yeah, more. You're not going to go through more of the mouth. And I was, I, yeah. Yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right, right. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think I think it's just interesting. So I, I thought I'd just uh, ask the question there. Um, in terms of these cases, what are the whistle stop indications this patient might need something doing? So we'll start with the little ones, then we'll do maybe little older kids, and then you know adolescent. Uh, why they would need it? You're saying? Yeah. So indications when you when you're examining or you're hearing history. What are the little alarm bells that you need to watch out for saying, actually, somebody needs to go see deep? Yeah, sure. So let's start with the, the little ones. So if they're infants, like, you know, post, post 10 days born, haven't gained their birth weight, or they're still, they're at their birth weight, but there's issues with feeding. In the infant, what I'm looking at is a twofold. I'm looking at issue for the mom, and there'll be an issue for the baby. Um, mm. for biggest thing is a poor latch so they're constantly hungry they're really fussy all the time when they're drinking um there's sometimes a that's like a clicking sound uh where they're not able to undulate that tongue and really express milk whether it's from the breast or from the bottle um any kind of nipple source yeah I, you get a little bit something called aerophagia where you're taking in air along with milk so these babies are hungry often because you think they're full but they're not full because what causes them to get full is that air that they're taking in. Um, so they're very gassy. There's a lot of reflux. They spit up quite often. They're drooling or dribbling milk um, from the side of their mouth. So that's where you're going to see, you know, with, with the babies. From a mother's standpoint, um, it's equally bad, if not a little bit worse, because you're feeling the pain. So these kids are going to be chomping or biting on the breast, resulting in sore nipples, cracked nipples, bleeding nipples. Um, moms are constantly tired because your child is constantly hungry because they're, they're not just satiated. And as a result, sometimes there's engorgement or, you know, these moms can get mastitis quite often. Uh, mm -hmm. And 
but that, that and it, it's no fun. You have to drain that, and just your, your your entire breast is just so tender and so sore. Um, you can get like nipple thrush as well. So these are all signs and, and symptoms. And the biggest thing for for moms, it's a psychological issue. You know, they think I have it's like mom guilt, and they're they're doing something wrong. Um, they're not producing enough milk, or they're not positioning their child properly in the breast. And it, it's nothing to do with mom. It's just the baby's anatomy. And unless that it's a, unless the biggest word is my, my favorite word is the root cause. Unless you get to the root cause, um, you know th that won't heal and that mom guilt will continue and we don't want that um yeah. for, for kids who are older um and i said like they're getting closer to speech they're getting closer to like their phonation and, and learning their speech and looking at the six seven eight range what i what i look for i went over this like i said the three s's sweep uh, speech and sleep um and and that's really what i'm looking for i want i want these children to be able to sit their tongue out i want them to be able to clean their vestibule um because I, let's be let's be honest not everybody brushes their teeth more than twice a day. And so throughout the day, daytime, if you're eating a good snack and there's food getting stuck in your cavities and your tongue it plays such an important role, role as a cleansing yeah. mechanism, they want to be able to do that. Um, have full range of motion. Speech is the big one. And that's usually the one that is kind of evaluated or heard first because you're talking to somebody and you have to talk to people in this world that we live in. And so that's the one that people catch on to first. Uh, you're looking at certain phonetics that involve the tongue, your TH sounds, your L sounds, your R sounds, Ns and Zs. And then last but not least, which is very important is like your, your sleep and that's correlated to airway. Um, and your tongue plays an enormous, enormous, enormous part in your airway. Um, I said this, my, one of my favorite exercises, you close your mouth, swallow, you'll notice that the tongue is part at the roof of your mouth. That's where it should be. Yeah. This nasal breathe releases a lot more nitric oxide, a vasodilation. There's a lot of good that comes out of that. These kids don't have the ability to do that or do that long term. And when they start sleeping, they may start out as nasal breathers and then the mouth opens and you hear and, that's, and the tongue comes down. As a result, they even might grind, uh, grind or clench. And that's another sign saying your body is silently saying, help, help, I need air. And by grinding and clenching, that's exactly what you're doing is you're bringing that jaw forward and you're allowing air to go back. And at the end of the day, that's the most important thing that you need to survive. So your body will, you know, uh, rob Peter to pay Paul so that you can stay alive and breathe. Um, and, and those are kind of what you're looking at in, in terms of that, that, that age group, the school kids. Now, when you look at adults, you know, young adolescents into adults, you're most likely, obviously your feeding stage is done um, in terms of feeding. Your speech is probably you have done a really good job in substituting certain sounds and words. And so that really may not become an issue anymore. But what you'll really see there are signs of bruxism and obstructive sleep apnea. And those are yeah. usually like the red flags for adults is that, hey, if I'm snoring constantly, I'm mouth breathing, there's something, there's a reason why that's chronically happening. And it's a good idea to get your tongue checked. Now I say not all, not all um, tongue ties warrant a release and that's super important because i'm, I'm a believer it's, it has to be the 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 goal has to end i mean you're, you're what you're doing has to have an objective and it's got to meet the goal so if they're everything's fine even though they may have a tongue tie but they're able to do everything i just described totally fine no need. then live and let live and you and you just evaluate and you keep an eye on it exactly and yeah so yeah, yeah I, th I think that's pretty uh pretty comprehensive um so hopefully if any of you guys are seeing patients you can start looking you know telling the the moms bring the little ones in because i get this this kind of comment quite a few times when someone's you know pregnant and they're coming for a checkup uh for an exam so we can see what's going on um they say oh um, yeah i'll bring the baby in, in a couple of years when they get teeth yeah. and really actually you want to see them straight away or you know relatively soon so you can pick up some of these issues because if the longer they leave it, the the more the more time will have gone that these things can fester on for. So um, you've now got if you if you have these kind of uh, comments from patients and mothers or expectant mothers, you can now say actually this is why we want you to come in earlier, not you know not just oh yeah just bring them in. Uh, but I don't really know why, but there are things that you can look out for. So. Uh, I think that's a re useful resource that we've we've kind of gone through there. Um, I think one last question about the lasers: What yeah. other applications are there? Obviously, we're doing laser pronectomies. What other applications are there? You know, when the guy comes across and he goes, "Okay, let me let me show you this laser," uh, just for the like kind of restorative and you know non non pediatric kind of dentists who are going to be listening in. 
Yeah, so I also use a laser, laser for uh, pericornitis. So if I have a 13-year-old, 12-year-old molecule coming in, um, has that operculum in the back and just isn't going away, I've done mm -hmm. a few cases where I'm able to use the laser uh, to remove the extra tissue. And it's so much easier than, like I said, you could go the old-fashioned route of getting them numb, um, which I still do, but then using a 15 blade and you get a lot of bleeding back there and a lot of more, you know, higher chances of post-op complications. So you can use that um, for the same method. I've done a few gingivectomies as well, and there's a great result. I think it's so much better to go the laser out just in terms of precision. And I think you alluded to the fact earlier that by using the laser, you only like are taking about eight, eight cells per cut rather than like a couple hundred. And so yeah. when you look at gingiva, especially for like, like, you know, general dentist, cosmetic dentist, I mean, it's cosmetic, right? You really want those gums to look as equal and as pristine as possible. And so I think you get a lot better control and a lot better aesthetic outcome. Uh, for gingivectomies. And then last but not least, the other aspect where I use it for is doing, um, if there's an impacted canine, for example, and creating an access site. Um, I'll work with orthodontists and we'll try to create an access window where you can put a button on and a chain and help to bring that tooth down. Now, it, it depends. Like you're looking at you know, the mucosa gingiva. I don't do it for all of them. It's all, it kind of depends on, hey, how much you know attached keratinized gingiva do we have? And it's going to affect that. Um, sometimes you do it. It's your best option. And then they'll go see a periodontist for a, a positional flap to help you know bring some more attached gingiva in that area. But uh, I just had a case with that. I'll be seeing this girl, uh, I think, next week. I'm coordinating with the orthodontist, but we did that for her. And so far the outcome has been great. And so there's many, many uses to it. I know there's lasers in terms of drilling teeth and, you know, a non-invasive route. I haven't explored with that. I'm not comfortable, yeah. comfortable with that. I don't know the efficacy in terms of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of people, a lot of oral surgeons will use it from troughing, a troughing bone. Um, once again, that's beyond the scope of my practice. So I yeah. kind of stick with lines, but there's a lot of different application uses. Um, and you can, like I said, depending on your, your level of training and your expertise, you can take this in a myriad of different ways. Yeah, I think it'd be great kind of from what I, you know, deep margin elevation, that's going to make it so much easier. Yeah. It's instant cauterization, no, no fluid coming in that cavity when you're trying to bring that margin up. I can imagine it just makes things so much easier. So uh, yeah. I think that's probably another great, great use for it. Um, yeah. But I, we've taken up like an hour over an hour of your time um, <laughs> yeah thanks for coming on apologies for technical difficulties i never even thought my phone could actually overheat um no worries i never, I never thought england was going to get this warm so um there's, there's a couple of bits going on there uh yeah. we'll share this on igtv guys if you're watching and you've enjoyed it send a screenshot pop it out on your story make sure everyone's following uh deep on his profile the superhero dentist um i'm sure we'll catch up with you again some point uh once everything is back to normal we'll see how things are going uh sure. see if we've got some some different cases for us to look at maybe some videos uh as well seeing as now we can actually do that i was i was uh i was experimenting there i was thinking is this going to work or not um so yeah, it's been good right that's really cool that's really really nice um yeah. having yeah. man give me the opportunity to yeah go over the stuff it's neat no, it's a pleasure. Um, so, guys, thank you for joining us. Uh, if you are interested, we've got a couple more guys on this week. Tomorrow, we've got Dr. Ansar. He is a cosmetic dentist doing a lot of composite uh, veneers and edge bonding in the UK. On Friday, we've got um, another guy, and he uh, runs his own podcast. He might even be in the comments down there. Uh, so we'll be, we'll be throwing out some stories uh, Saturday implant dentistry with Dr. Magaria. Um, and he's a teacher at the British Academy of implant and restorative dentistry. I think that's what it stands for. But, uh, so that's going to be really cool. So guys keep tuned. We've got absolute loads coming for you. All. Um, and thanks again to deep for coming on and sharing us, uh, these cases, which have been really interesting. You got it, man. Take care dude. Stay blessed. We'll talk soon. Sweet. See you later guys. Bye. Hey guys.